Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to Ursa Astronomical Association's first public talk of the autumn. Uh, this, uh, this evening's talk is in English, uh, as you may already have guessed. Um, I'm sorry, we're a bit late. There was a technical issue, but we're fine now. Um, you can ask questions in the chat and we'll go through them after the talk. And you can also ask your questions in Finnish and I'll do my best to translate them. Um, so today there was a partial solar eclipse that could, uh, at least in theory, be seen everything, everywhere in, uh, in Finland. But unfortunately, the weather was cloudy in many parts of the country. Uh, but that's Finland in October for you. Uh, nevertheless, we will continue discussing solar eclipses tonight, especially total solar eclipses. Uh, solar eclipses are rare and total eclipses even rarer. Uh, historically, total solar eclipses have both baffled minds and offered unprecedented opportunities to deepen our understanding of the sun and the laws of physics. Uh, nowadays, total solar eclipses remain a sought-after celestial phenomenon, but scientists are still hard at work when a total solar eclipse graces the sky. Now, we're interested in what kind of research opportunities do total solar eclipses offer? What can they tell us of the workings of our own central star or the space weather that affects us all? And our speaker this evening is the chair of the International Astronomical Union Working Group of Solar Eclipses, Professor Jay Pasachov from Williams College in Massachusetts. Professor Pasachov, it's so lovely to have you with us this evening. The stage is yours. Well, I'm very glad to be with you. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I had to cancel my physical trip at the last minute, but I'm glad we put these things together. And also by being home in Williamstown, Massachusetts, um, the uh, I did receive in the last hour uh, a few slides, photos from from everywhere, all over, from the Taj Mahal and elsewhere. So uh, I put those in at the end of the talk. I'm going to start now with an interesting uh, uh, transit of Venus that we went to in 2004 in Greece. And uh, the late John Saradakis uh, worked with us there. Three of my students at the, uh, at the top left from, from Williams College uh, are posing in front of uh, one of the Aristotle University's uh, dome. And we had a good time observing there in the middle on the right, you, you see the composer, Philip Glass, who was premiering uh, one of his pieces. Now let's see if we can advance the slide. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, so I had a, a bunch of slides, a, a bunch of uh, colleagues with me, and my wife standing next to Aristotle in the back, and my uh, uh, se senior uh, colleague, uh, Bryce Babcock. His wife is in is in the back uh, there, and. John Siridakis in the front row, who unfortunately has passed away since then. But every once in a while, there are these wonderful uh, events that are uh, one-offs. Well, this is really a two-off. There were total, there were um, transits of Venus in 2004 and 2012. And so now we have to wait 2117 uh, to get the next one. So solar eclipses are not that rare. Uh, there can be three or so uh, eclipses of all types during a year, but uh, but no more than two of them would be total uh, solar eclipses. Uh, so uh, that eclipse that I showed, the group I showed there was en route to Castellarizo, uh, a Greek island off the coast of Turkey, uh, which we observed in 2006. And with the uh, moon, the disk there covering the uh, the, the, the covering the everyday sun substantially, then we see this faint corona at the left. And then if we put a lot of images of the corona together, uh, we uh, can overcome the problem that the corona is a million times fainter than the, than the everyday sun. So that when any of the everyday sun gets through, 
it turns the sky blue and wipes out a lot of the ability to see the outer part of the solar corona. So at a posh, at a total eclipse, uh, my team studies especially the uh, the solar corona, and on the right you can see how it's controlled by the sun's magnetic field. At the bottom left, you see uh, the uh, pole here, and the bottom on the top right, uh, a, a pole here. Those are polar plumes with the gas held in place by the uh, magnetic field coming out of the top of the sun. And at the equator at upper left and lower right, we get other configurations that come uh, from the magnetic field. And I'll be showing you various uh, eclipses and magnetic fields. But uh, today, uh, we did not have a total eclipse. We had a partial eclipse. And so the sky was, uh, was uh, had enough uh, everyday sun shining into it. And the sky remained blue in places where there were no clouds. Uh, and uh, so we were unable to see the shape of the corona. Though so now we have spacecraft up in, in the uh, 16 years since these photos uh, were made and we're getting regular images of the sun in the configuration of the magnetic field. Anyway, I had one prior eclipse in Helsinki in 1990 and my wife and I and our two daughters were uh, with me then. And, uh, uh, but uh, because of the weather and the locations, we uh, were one of, on one of three or four planes that took off from Helsinki and flew northeast uh, to get above uh, to get above the clouds. And uh, here you see there are three planes uh, at, uh, at that time. And uh, here's my daughter Eloise in front of one of the uh, one of the charter planes. And uh, and there were a number of uh, images made. Here's an image made by my friend and colleague Serge Kushmi from the Institut d'Astrophysique in uh, in Paris, uh, who had various uh, uh, observing stations around. But but here you can see his composite there, and you can see the reddish prominences at the upper left and on the upper right. You can see what's uh, called the Bailey's bead. The last Bailey's bead is called the diamond ring. Um, in which a little bit of the everyday sun is peering out from a valley on the edge of the moon, and that's uh, bright enough to turn the sky uh, the sky blue. So it's always a very beautiful uh, configuration, and I hope everyone listening uh, gets a chance to uh, um, come to some future uh, eclipse. Uh, Anne, can you confirm that you are broadcasting this to your listenership? Because I'm showing two participants, you and me, but uh, you are spreading your uh, your feed to others. Yes, this is being watched on YouTube right now. Good. Oh, on YouTube. Good. Good. Okay. And are you recording on YouTube? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, anyway, here are just some pictures out the window in 1990, and you can see the uh, to the left, uh, the dark moon, that's the side of the moon that's facing us, so it's the near side of the moon. The sun is beyond it, and we see the solar corona is kind of blurry there, and then there are out of focus uh, images around on the, uh, on the screen of the uh, eclipse, and Here's my family and, and I uh, on the uh, plane. And in the middle top, you can see an image that was just made of uh, uh, what we call a pinhole camera. I've made a little circle with my hand there and it's projecting uh, a, an image of the partial eclipse on the, well, in this case, on the uh, table. And in the background, uh, I have an, an image, and you'll see uh, uh, where the corona is, but this is a background image of the last uh, total eclipse in the United States uh, from, in, from 20, 
uh, 17 and it's cropped in this part of the background there, but you can see how clear it was for us then. Um, so here's an image from the from the plane again in 1990, and the uh, image of the uh, moon and the eclipse is coming down to Earth, but the shadow of the moon is a big uh, a triangle, and at the lower left of the screen, the way we're looking at it, you can see we're looking out beyond that shadow of the moon and seeing the blue sky from beyond, and if you look far enough, uh, we're seeing uh, reddish, which is because the uh, atmospheric light, the Earth's atmospheric light between that and us has uh, scattered out uh, a lot of the uh, blue to make blue skies for people over there. Anyway, here's the path in, uh, in 1990, and uh, um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so so here we are. It began at the, at Finland and then went high over places that we don't want to be these days, uh, but went across the top of Asia there. Here's a higher precision uh, map showing where we were towards the beginning of the eclipse. We took off from Helsinki and uh, uh, and got good views of the eclipse in 1990. Now, my, my uh, colleague, Aris Vulgaris from Greece, started working with us a couple of decades ago. He saw John Syridakis Sir, in the picture with him although that has uh, 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 Mr. Professor Seridakis from the Aristotle University in, in uh, Thessaloniki has uh, since died. Um, but in 2019 here, the, uh, uh, my main team was on the center line in Chile, but then we got, uh, the rights to have four more people come up. The, and the uh, Saratololo Mountain is a little further north and, uh, and not right on the center line. So the totality duration was a little shorter. Uh, but we did have the opportunity to send four more people. And we did that. And uh, uh, Aris Vulgaris uh, made, uh, made these images uh, first of the uh, edge of the sun and this reddish what we call the chromosphere from uh, the different colors in the spectrum especially hydrogen alpha that gives the red but there are all the other hydrogen lines that go across the spectrum and uh and in second contact um so first contact is when it's first kissing the uh the edge of the moon and second contact is when it goes inside and we see only this little thin ring around it. And you can see again, the polar plumes from the magnetic field, not as well defined as they were before, but nonetheless, and, and then the equator for the, for the streamers there. Um, and then that lasts a couple of minutes, as much as seven minutes, we don't usually get that. And then at the end, um, we get third contact when the moon moves across, blocking the, the sun, and we get third contact, and the Bailey's beads are several little bits coming through uh, through uh, valleys on the edge of the moon. And the last one uh, gives some sunlight that looks so bright, we call it the diamond ring uh, effect. Yes. Anyway, I've been observing uh, Eclipses since Professor Donald Menzel, a noted eclipse observer, started me off when I was a freshman at Harvard back in 1959. I've been to 36 uh, total solar eclipses uh, since, uh, since then. And as you see, it's taken me all over the world to, uh, to do that. And at the very end, I'll show you some maps of where we want to go next, <clears throat> which include uh, Australia, 
uh, this coming spring over here. These are past eclipses, so it's not showing there. And then, uh, but there is an eclipse uh, there in in this spring. And then in 2024, there's an eclipse that comes across uh, Mexico and, and, the, and the Eastern United States uh, and Mexico. Uh, uh, cloudiness statistic is very good. Uh, so, so we have a very good chance for the clouds of seeing this one. Uh, and and here's, the, here's that uh, path over here. You see it's very narrow. It starts a little bit as annular uh, when an annulus, that means a ring of everyday sunlight remains visible around, uh, around the moon. <clears throat> but it starts with just that little bit of an annularity at the beginning, but then turns total. So the moon and the sun are pretty much the same size. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's why the path is so much now we're uh, there. And the forecasts are excellent for this part here and then, but then turn cloudy when, you get, when we get up to Indonesia and to Papua New Guinea. And, um, and we'll, go, uh, we'll go more into, uh, into that. And then we're looking forward in my country, especially to this 2024 eclipse that hits the shore of Mexico, where the weather statistics are very good, and uh, and then gets worse and worse as we go in the springtime, uh, north and east in the uh, in the United States. Anyway, I am amused that in this last year, in twenty twenty one we had a North Pole eclipse that went across and we were not allowed to go into Canada to go there or it would have been in Greenland or Canada. Uh, but as it turns out, we flew in a plane from just south of the Canadian border into uh, the path of angularity. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then on December 4th here, uh, some months later, uh, the eclipse was uh, over Antarctica, and you can see the shadow of the moon uh, at the South Pole here. So it's kind of fun to have both North and South Pole in the same uh, year. And then since then, there was a, a partial, uh, a partial eclipse uh, off the uh, off the edge of uh, of the. Uh, uh, South America, but but here's where there were partial eclipses of, uh, in that uh, uh, April 30th eclipse in, uh, in 2021. When we get a nice sharp image, and you'll see from today, some sharp images have just uh, come in of the moon going across the sun uh, here. And it's like uh, the moon is 400 times closer than the sun is. And then there'll be some sets of us uh, on the sun. I went with uh, Patricio Rojo from the University of Chile to a partial eclipse in April. And we were able to see it off the coast of Viña del Mar in, in, the, middle of, uh, in the middle of Chile. And there are many reasons for studying the, the sun and Anne has been kind enough to translate it into, uh, into Finnish. Then we're studying, so I'll read the English, if you'll forgive me and you can read the Finnish. But we're studying the magnetic fields over the 11 year sunspot cycle uh, and how that changes. And the uh, sunspot cycle uh, held, holds up the uh, the hot gas in the solar corona to a different extent in the beautiful shapes. And then sometimes uh, a gas, hot coronal gas is ejected from the sun. We call them a mass, coronal mass ejections. And they go through the solar system. And between the sun and the earth, we get something called space weather, which is the hot gas from the solar corona. 
uh, that uh, an instrument or an astronaut ha would have to fly through. Uh, and, uh, and we do have a couple of instruments now, the solar orbiter from the European Space Agency or the Parker Solar Probe from uh, the American Space Agency or NASA. Uh, and, and so we're studying uh, them and these coronal mass ejections that uh, aren't always there, but in any case to be different at each uh, eclipse. And so we're watching this so-called space weather. And then it turns out that the gas, the white stuff that you saw around the sun is really hot. In other words, it's a million kelvins. And that took a long time to figure out from the discovery of the spectrum of that gas in 1870 until the 1940s. And they realized it was a million degrees uh, when they could see iron 14 is 13 times ionized iron as iron one is neutral iron. So iron two is once ionized. Uh, so to get to 14, you have 13 times ionized and iron 10 is nine times ionized. So this is about a million, this is about a million and a half uh, degrees. And there's some argon 10 uh, and, and the other, uh, let's see. Well, and, and there are other <clears throat> uh, spectral lines that can be seen. And one of my team's observations is to carry out measurements of the corona with this hot gas, say iron 10, iron 14, at uh, less than one se one uh, sec. <coughs> and and uh, nobody really knows how the, the coronal gas gets to be a million degrees. And we're testing a theory that, uh, that it's vibrating some loops in the magnetic field at the edge of the, uh, of the sun. Uh, but, but there are over a dozen methods proposed for coronal heating and nobody knows yet which uh, of them is uh, the true method or maybe several of them are all working uh, uh, together. And we're also studying with the late uh, uh, Venezuelan Professor of Atmospheric Physics uh, what, how that affects the Earth's weather. In 2015 from Svalbard, uh, Mr. Bogaris uh, made these spectra as part of our team. And you can see the spectral line here, the big yellow line that comes from uh, sodium. Uh, but in 1868, Jules Janssen from France discovered, uh, this, uh, discovered uh, uh, that in, in addition to these, uh, well, here, the sodium lines are this doublet of lines here. And he discovered an even brighter line here that you see the big one there, oops. And they called that helium because it seemed to exist only on the sun. And of course we now know that it's a common element uh, with a small number of, of uh, protons. And uh, within another year, uh, some some scientists had discovered this ring of green, and this is the iron 14 uh, line, uh, and uh, this is what's known as a slitless spectrum. We let the narrow part of the sun or its atmosphere um, define what would have been a slit, and it took from 1870 till around 1940 for this to be identified as iron 14, which is the 13 times ionized uh, gas, iron gas, and therefore it has to be over a million degrees, well over a million degrees to uh, form this form this here. Oops. Well, anyway, so we try to deconstruct the uh, the uh, spectrum, and, uh, and so here's the diameter of the sun here, uh, but then we get some continuous uh, radiation here, 
as the moon goes across the sun. There are a lot of spectral lines that you uh, see here in the uh, in the low chromosphere. Uh, here's a recent paper, 2022, from Mr. Mugaris, who is with us, and some colleagues um, through John Siridakis, the professor at the University of uh, Thessaloniki. But you can see there are some lines from, from iron and from calcium, but the uh, helium and sodium lines are just uh, are just stronger uh, here, and there are more helium lines. So that was the major discovery of the last century and the identification of the major discovery of this century. Anyway, we tried to observe all the total eclipses, and in particular, on December 4th, there was a total eclipse over uh, near and over Antarctica, and I took advantage of some plotting to go down from South America near um, the bottom tip, the southern tip of Chile. And here is a graph, that, well, a photo we made from an airplane. There were uh, a couple of planes that flew out of Punta Arenas near the southern part of Chile. And this is a snapshot I took looking out, uh, looking out my window on, on the left side of the plane, so you can only use one side of the plane when you're doing this. And here's the shadow of this dark side of the, of the moon or of the moon here. And then we're looking far enough away past that umbra shadow uh, and seeing uh, a little blue sky, but then further and closer to the ground, uh, red, the reddishness uh, from light that has taken the blue out to make blue skies between it and us. Here's Anyway, my colleague Le uh, Glenn Schneider made these calculations from Punta Arenas. There was a path of, of totality that we could get to the uh, beginning of the sunrise point, only four degrees of the horizon. And then the path went through uh, the Weddell Sea here, the Scotia Sea here and then hit the Union Glacier on Antarctica. And we had two teams on Union Glacier. Uh, and I'll show you the people in a, in a minute uh, here. So we had uh, one airborne experiment and, or one airborne set of experiments, and then people on Union Glacier. Now we're in a, a time of, the sunspot cycle, we're here, we're, we were here. So we're in a rising time of the sunspot cycle. We had been at sunspot minimum with very little magnetic fields on the sun back in, in, uh, in 2020. And there had been a, a maximum back in 2014, uh, but, uh, but now we're coming up uh, again. The sunspot number is not actually the number of sunspots, but it's 10 times the number of groups plus the number of spots. So for example, if there are two sunspots on the sun, if they're together, 10 times two is 20 plus the number of individual spots. But if they're on different parts of the sun, uh, then, then uh, the number of groups is two. Uh, so multiply by 10, you get 20. I think before I might have said that wrong. If the two are together, there's one group. So that's 10 plus the number of individual spots. But now for the same number of spots that can be separate. So you get two groups. So that's 20 plus the number of spots. And that's not the very best way of plotting things, except for the fact that it's been done since around 1850. And so we have a great continuity for the uh, magnetic field on the uh, on the sun. So we took off in Punta Arenas, and uh, uh, two of my students, uh, uh, Peter Knowlton and Anna Tessalini, flew with us here. She should graduate Anna next year, and Peter Knowlton uh, graduated last year, Mujo Lu, and we were on a charter flight on the Chilean National Airline, took off from Punta Arenas, 
Uh, so it was just after midnight when we uh, took off there. Here I am with my traditional orange pants that I wear on eclipse days, and my wife with Mujo Lu, and here's our group waiting to take off uh, here with the uh, Emma Sobel with us and Nicole Massetti and uh, David Slesky here with us for the group on the plane. So here is uh, our image. This is an iPhone image I took uh, out the side window uh, as the, soon after the eclipse began. And you can see the, the dark, the side of the moon that is facing us. And then just the corona that comes, uh, that comes around it. And here's the, the main shadow there. The... So here's that image a little. Larger and of course it's very exciting to see these things that last usually two or three minutes. It could be only seconds, it could be as much as six or seven minutes, but we're very happy when we get two or three minutes. There is a research company called Predictive Science Incorporated, largely funded by NASA uh, in, uh, in near San Diego, California, and they take measurements of the magnetic field of the sun uh, going back through the year, especially for the last month or two, because we need a solar rotation of about once a month um, to in incorporate what the, the backside of the sun uh, looks like as the sun rotates about once a month. And so here is their prediction on the left here, and here is our observations on, on the right, and we can see the streamers here once we put together uh, the various uh, parts of the uh, of the sun, and uh, uh, and here and this is actually a slider that you can show the whole prediction or our whole occultation. And this is available uh, online. We have a slider online you can work with if you go to my website at eclipses.info. For example, you can get access to uh, uh, to this. So that was the last total eclipse on December fourth, and uh, uh, well, so there's there are usually uh, two eclipses uh, a year, uh, or or so. In any case, from our flight at. 4,100 feet altitude, that's around uh, 1,300 meters of altitude, and Aris Vulgaris, and a distinguished senior physicist from the University of Chicago, Tom Economo, uh, was with him and us, and, uh, and they took spectra across the, the spectrum. But remember, there's the left side and the right side to the sun, so some of these spectral lines are, are doubled. And, uh, uh, and we can get some radiation from iron-14, which is 13 times ionized iron, because iron-1 is, is uh, neutral. So iron-2 is once ionized. And so iron-14 is 13 times uh, ionized. And then helium, uh, left side, right side of the sun uh, in, the, uh, in the yellow, and the iron 10 is uh, uh, the painter. And H alpha is a lot cooler, more like 10,000 degrees instead of a million degrees. Anyway, it was uh, just gorgeous in 2021 uh, for the uh, eclipse. And you can see what's held together with the solar magnetic field. So here are the polar plumes. And uh, uh, and our uh, our colleague let me back here. I guess this is not letting me go uh, go back. Uh, but Miloslav Druckmuller has put together a lot of uh, of different uh, images, very high quality to show the, the, uh, 
the small scale work in, in the Quran. And then there's a European spacecraft called Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. And uh, there has different instruments on it, uh, one of which uh, is the, runs these coronagraphs, C2 coronagraph, uh, and that's shown in gray here, uh, where there's a disk that blocked the uh, corona and anything else out to this almost uh, two times the radius of the uh, of the sun and uh, and then now uh, somebody had the bright idea that uh, that instead of this dark moon here we could just display the uh, hot gas uh, by getting an image with the solar ultraviolet imager uh, here um, which is by the initials uh, SUVI. So this is millions of degree gas here, and this is millions of degree gas here. And then the question is what is bridging those two? And that's the part that we observe at a solar eclipse. And here again is the uh, path of the eclipse, where you see it comes out of, of uh, uh, Punta Arenas in Florida, and then we spent three hours and captured uh, totality here and flew uh, with it uh, down uh, the Weddell Sea over here and crossed over the Union Glacier. And we had two teams on, on Union Glacier. One of the teams uh, had a uh, student, Theo Boris, uh, with his parents, Peter Boris and Janet Boris, uh, making images. And when the eclipse began, we could see a little bit of Bailey's bead, diamond ring right on the edge here. Uh, and, uh, and then we see the coronal streamers uh, all, uh, all around. And the uh, colleague, Patricia Rojo, a professor of uh, physics at the University of Chile, uh, made this image from a composite of a number of, uh, of different uh, uh, expo uh, exposures. And you can see here again, the polar plumes and the equatorial uh, streamers. And we work also with Wojto uh, Rusin from Slovakia and, uh, and through him with his colleague, Robin Hubchak. So if you're looking down from a spacecraft, one of those monitoring spacecraft, you can see the shadow of the moon come across the earth here. Look, look carefully there. And this is from a monitoring spacecraft, a geosynchronous satellite in the United States. It's on a, a line of longitude, and this is the eastern one. And here, this is slowed down a little bit to, to show the shadow going across uh, the Union Glacier, giving a little more time to make images there. And here's a little slower. So if you were up in space, you could take that image with the spacecraft. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, a Russian astronaut took some images just from Soyuz as, uh, as it uh, went overhead. And we do have this uh, DISCOVER, an acronym of, of a NASA spacecraft. And, uh, um, and, and it made this image that you've seen already right here at the uh, South Pole. Oops. So here is, oops. here's the path here. It's partial eclipse and you see the totality came here. We observed it there, we observed it from the ground uh, there. 
And here is the Russian astronaut looking down and seeing that same shadow on, on the surface with her own eyes. So what are we up to now in, this, in uh, April 20th, in a few months, uh, the, there will be a, a shadow, a lunar shadow that will come across the Pacific and clip just a little bit of uh, uh, Australia for us to observe from there. And then we'll go up to uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. But the weather for forecast the statistics going back decades are really very poor uh, there. Uh, so very little chance of seeing totality. But from here, we're all concentrating our plans because it's uh, usually excellent uh, clear weather from Exmouth uh, here or Learmouth uh, in uh, this little uh, northwest corner of Australia. And then we come into 23, 2023, and 2024. And so there's an annular eclipse with this annulus of sunlight there. So it starts in Oregon, where we had the last total eclipse there, and then, and then went over a lot of the southwestern United States. Uh, there's pretty good weather statistics around here, particularly Albuquerque, and then uh, uh, came through Texas and out to sea. Uh, but then the big, then the big eclipse is uh, that we're concentrating on is on April eighth, twenty twenty four, when we will join the uh, eclipse here, where the uh, the uh, path crosses the Mexican coast and the Pacific here, and it's almost always clear there, uh, and then the weather statistics get worse as you go into Texas, although it's still decent of about 50-50 in Texas, and then comes through the Midwestern United States, and then comes to upstate New York and upstate New England, Vermont and New Hampshire, and, and, and Maine, a little bit of the maritime provinces of Canada. Uh, my own university is right here at the upper left hand corner of uh, of Massachusetts, but we do intend for my team, and I got support from my National Science Foundation for the scientific experiment to come down to uh, to Mexico for that 2024 uh, eclipse. So here is a, a map of that, where blue is the good color coding. You see, where uh, Never any clouds, or ten percent, or or sometimes as high as twenty percent, and many people are going to go to Texas. Though I see that's really fifty-fifty here with the clouds in Texas, and then this is the populated part of the United States, uh, and there you see it's more like eighty uh, percent uh, cloudiness there. So I've asked our university people to send all the students from Williams College here uh, up to here, uh, even though it's cloudy 80% uh, of the time, 75% of the time, but we don't have a final arrangement, it's certainly cheapest to send them from here to here than to send them from here to here. So I'll be taking my scientific team and the, and the top students down to uh, this uh, zero or 10% uh, cloudiness uh, region for our experiments. And you can see that Mazatlan on the Mexican coast has a statistic of being cloudy only a quarter of the time or, or even a little less around there, whereas in Texas it's closer to 50% of the time. And uh, in Northern New England, near where I live, it's more like 70% or, or a, little for, a little further, even up to 80% there. Uh, and uh, I've worked with Jay Anderson, who does these statistics, and the prior author, uh, who's now deceased, on a 
a field guide to weather in which we explain all that. And I've also done a field guide to the stars and planets uh, and inherited from Professor Donald uh, Menzel. So these are both uh, available. Anyway, I've worked with Professor Roberta J.M. Olson, uh, an art historian on uh, various uh, wonderful images in the art world, some photography, but mainly just uh, drawings and paintings of things related to astronomy. And I came out a year or so ago. And then with Professor Dion Golub from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, we did a book on the sun with all, with all the science uh, in it. So I'd be very pleased, obviously, for you to read those two books. And then we came to what, where we just were this week, uh, where the weather statistics were, were better in Kazakhstan and, uh, and here in, in Finland, a little better than in Sweden or Norway, although I have seen some 15% chance uh, image from the United uh, uh, Kingdom and and the, the no eclipse in the United States or in the eastern part of uh, Asia or uh, uh, or in uh, in Africa. So here's my list of eclipses again. So I've been all over, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this uh, 2024 uh, eclipse, well, uh, the first, the 2023 eclipse, total eclipse April 20th is just clipping this corner here. And then 2024 comes ashore in Mexico and, uh, and you know, goes through Texas and up to the Northeastern United States populated part. Anyway, here's today's, um, uh, sunspot a snapshot where you can see a number of sunspot groups and I uh, haven't shown you any close-ups so you can see that there's some darker part and some lighter part so the darker part of the umbra is surrounded by the penumbra and the umbra is where the heaviest magnetic field is the strongest magnetic field but here we have one two three four uh and if you look in, in detail, five, six uh, groups. And so there are at least, uh, the sunspot number is at least 60 uh, today that's listed. And these are from a site called spaceweather.com. So you can follow this, uh, this every day. And you can see a little rippling here, the so-called uh, granulation. Um, And there's another site that monitors things daily called solarmonitor.org. And we can see, uh, and this is a couple of days old, a few days old, because um, they don't update it every day. But, uh, but here you can see the uh, strong magnetic field over a few days. And then the sun rotates uh, on this scale from left to right. And so these would have been rotated off the off the edge by by today, and uh, and here is what the uh, sunspots would have looked like uh, with some brighter sunspots here. And then if you go to coronal gas at millions of degrees, there are a couple of spacecraft that are mapping that, and uh, and you can see uh, that these. Uh, active regions uh, are strongest where uh, where the, uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field is strongest. Uh, anyway, here is uh, here is the this latest latest sunspot cycle. Last a dozen years, I've indicated before that we had a real minimum here in twenty. 18, 19, 20, and 
but then since then it's been rising fast and uh, and we're here uh, right uh, right now uh and uh, and then we don't really know what's going to happen in the future for the next couple of years here are the last one two three four five six cycles you can see the most recent cycle that uh, reached the most recent the depth here in 2018, 2019 uh, here, uh, but is uh, but the maxima are sometimes much less. So maybe there's some other cycle in addition to the 11 year cycle. Maybe there's some longer cycle to propose and people are looking at that. But we're going up, up, up now and people are taking bets on how high this next cycle is going to reach. And, and then I'm going to show you some pictures from yesterday's uh, eclipse, or was it this morning already? Um, and uh, uh, anyway, so here and here's uh, another, uh, another eclipse that's, that uh, you're going to benefit from in, uh, in Finland in in, 20, in 2030 here, when, when the path actually goes much, much further south. Anyway, I collected some of the images from today. Uh, and uh, Xavier Jubier did a lot of uh, calculating of the paths of eclipses for everybody's benefit. And he stayed in France, uh, close to home, and here's just a, a picture through his uh, with his uh, camera uh, showing here. And then these are three images from Anthony, France, where the, the path of, of the, the moon just came by and went this way here. And you'll be able to see that the sunspots are the same in all three. But the first contact, the, the moon just knocked off a little bit here and we do need filters here to reduce this uh, this brightness uh, by a factor of uh, of almost a million uh, to get down to this brightness. And then an hour later, uh, so thirteen and a half percent were obscured by the sun, and you can measure when this crosses the uh, uh, that sunspot, for example, and you can compare in this way also uh, with uh, with what you see from those uh, satellites, uh, because we know exactly where the moon is, and we can measure to high precision from the time uh, just what's uh, what's being blown. And then it went down this way, and so just was leaving here at the edge of the sun, just almost at fourth contact, and as you can see the, uh, uh, the sunspots of where they are. So this is oriented the same, the same way. So those are photos from today. And then the most interesting is, uh, is from your Finnish uh, radio observatory, and this 14 meter radio telescope can uh, measure a radiation um, at a wavelength, eight millimeter wavelength that uh, does <clears throat> come through most clouds. So these are images that were all taken at your observatory. I don't know how to pronounce uh, Metsahovi uh, here, uh, but in any case, here we are just beginning, and the moon is about to, uh, to come in, 14 meter radio telescope. And then you see the moon is a little closer early this morning in the United States and noonish uh, for those of you in Finland. And, and here is the moon, uh, which just uh, took a little bit out of the uh, everyday sun, the so called photosphere. And then it continued. You can see the shape of the moon, and you can see how it blocks a third or so of 
the radio observatory at this wavelength, 37 gigahertz. And it's, it's uh, almost 10 o'clock this morning, universal time. And then in the middle of the eclipse from, from here, that's over here, 37 uh, gigahertz. And around 10.30, 10.20 or so uh, this morning, it was uh, pretty uh, central give this uh, white crescent. And then, and then it moved off. And the whole thing was taking under three hours for the moon to go across blocking some of the sun. And then a few people have been sending me images since from today, Martin Hintz, an interesting uh, uh, observer, a journalist, uh, put his iPhone uh, up to uh, one of these uh, a solar, uh, well, H alpha telescopes that shows the strong uh, red line. Uh, and we're able to get this, uh, this image here, of course, with uh, a better phone connection and camera connection, you can see higher resolution, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, and then uh, my colleague, Rob Wittenmeyer, uh, was trekking in Annapurna, and um, and he's come to a number of eclipses with us. So I really am surprised with him. Somehow he hasn't heard me uh, talking about uh, about eclipses. So he was caught unaware uh, in a place with a very clear sky, but without any uh, equipment for observing and photographing uh, the eclipse, even though it was gorgeous there in Nepal today. And then the last. One of the last things I got was a Facebook posting from a colleague in India who went on a, a water tank not far from the Taj Mahal. He got an image of both the Taj Mahal in the sky and, uh, uh, and the partial eclipse. And another uh, random image from Poland that my colleague Marek Zemianski sent me just before we went on. And, uh, and here he was looking through clouds. So this may not have had a filter even. This may be the natural filtering from the clouds. And I'm not sure about that, but I think so. And, uh, and then Aris Lugaris from, uh, from Thessaloniki in, in Greece had this uh, set up with various telescopes and, uh, and sent these two images here, and this is uh, that H alpha filter again, and and I don't know why he made it so pink, but he got really high resolution, really sharp uh, edges and corners, and here's the prominence that's coming off uh, off here, and uh, and again a, a nice sharp uh, image that he was able to uh, to get. And then I was just I sent this by my alumnus, Kamen Kazarev from Bulgaria. And, uh, and somebody made this excellent uh, uh, image here with some H-alpha. And you can see the granules appearing very sharp uh, here. And, uh, and then the magnetic field structure uh, here in, the, in this uh, sunspot region uh, of, uh, over here. So the sun does change from day to day. And, and so here's a movie from Finland. Yeah, I can see it just came off on the left side there. And that's what I have to show uh, today. So if anybody would like to ask me any questions, I can do that. I can answer any questions. Or I can try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Lovely. Uh, so anybody having any questions, you can write them in the chat. Meanwhile, I have some actually I have some I have several questions. We can start with at least okay. one of them. Uh, I was wondering about, uh, I mean, about the inner Corona. So, uh, if I've understood correctly, 
uh, you can see, you can only see currently, you can only see the inner corona uh, um, during total eclipses seen from Earth because the space telescope coronagraphs cover the innermost corona. Is that, is, is that still correct? Well, you have to define innermost, and <laughs> people are working on better and better coronagraphs, some of which uh, I only get rid of a, of a tiny bit of the inner corona. But, but you're right that, that uh, the, the innermost corona is still not available for being uh, uh, overcome by, by the uh, occulting disk. But they're making images with uh, smaller and smaller occulting disks. And in fact, the Europeans have a project to have two uh, spacecraft to go up in tandem. And uh, one of the problems with getting rid of the inner corona uh, is that if you uh, have an occulting disk, it's not in the same focus as the sun at 93 million miles away. Uh, so, so there are uh, plans that they're working on. There'll be a test flight next year uh, where, where they can very closely match the uh, occult or separate spacecraft. Uh, I forget how many meters away it is from the, uh, from the uh, camera, but uh, they do get a sharper edge and they do get a better, uh, a better occulting. So the, so the idea is to improve uh, the resolution and be able to have uh, uh, occultors that are more precise. Yeah. So you, um, I can understand that during a total eclipse, you can see the corona and, and study its structure, but uh, you also listed uh, lots of partial eclipses and annular eclipses in, in your like list. Uh, is there any um, new science that you can make during those eclipses? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that uh, uh, you can monitor when uh, active regions on the surface of the sun are covered over, uh, but, uh, but on the whole, the, uh, the resolution is so much better and the contrast at total eclipses that uh, the annular eclipse really is reduced to, to radio astronomy and you don't do so well with, with the optical, the optical uh, uh, the covering of the, uh, of the uh, solar disk by the moon. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and a question about coronal heating. Um, I know it's obviously, we, we don't know how the corona gets heated that hot. Uh, but and it's a fundamental thing to understand. But I was wondering if we could solve which mechanism actually uh, heats uh, the corona. Could it help us uh, predict space weather better? Well, I I certainly say yes to that. But I've been working myself for twenty years on that problem, and many <laughs> other people have too. And so what I like to say is that problem has been solved but it's been solved 19 different times by 19 different people. And, uh, and so there's no consensus on what mechanism, uh, on what mechanism it is. And, uh, and maybe it's even several mechanisms working together. So the thing that I'm investigating the most with my team, which we'll do again uh, in Australia this uh, spring, uh, is uh, what are called surface alphane waves uh, Dr. Jim Ionson, I-O-N-S-O-N, had uh, a, a theory of uh, rapid uh, vibrations of, uh, of rogue waves that are going over uh, uh, coronal, coronal loops. And uh, at, in the coronal loops at the edge of the sun uh, can have a big a big loop, say, in a prominence, is there other kind of, which are chromospheric loops or in a coronal loop. And then there can be what are called alphane waves that go across the loop and back and forth and back and forth, and they can vibrate the gas nearby and, and heat the sun that way. But 
Dr. Ironson some years ago uh, realized that on the on these loops there's a boundary level, and uh, and the period of the vibrations going along the boundary level is uh, can be a second or or half a second or so, and then that can um, can uh, ruffle the feathers of the gas near it and heat it up, and uh, and so we can get. Uh, some heating uh, from the surface alkane waves, and just which of these mechanisms is is heating by so much is hard to tell. So in my team, uh, we we do have some high resolution equipment at uh, at high uh, time resolution too, so we can measure the periods of the waves down to uh, half a second, uh, and. Uh, and see what heating is near these loops uh, as it goes by. So there's no consensus on just what is active and what will work. I see. But what what if uh, never mind the 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 actual mechanism, could it could it help us knowing it, could it help us uh, predict space weather any better than these days? Well, um, i th I think that these uh, this uh, stuff we're talking about the surface of alpha n waves the heating uh, near the loops is located near the sun and doesn't necessarily blast out right the stuff uh, toward the earth so right. clearly we want to understand what is uh, doing the heating as much as possible but i'm not specifically uh, thinking that that it will uh, uh, point out the details of some space weather events. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, our chat is is very very quiet at the moment, so I think we'll uh, we'll thank you, Professor Pesachov. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I'll see the rest of you <laughs> in two weeks' time when when Professor Marku Poutanen is going to tell us about the many many movements of the Earth. So thank you. <laughs>